morning, everyone. This is good morning, everyone. This is Ann Cuppinger from the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center, and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar on the Children and Youth Evaluation Service, or CES, which is the state-designated independent entity for children's home and community-based services. So we have um, part two of our presentation today. Um, if you missed part one, that was back in January, and the recording and slides from that presentation are on the MCTAC website. Um, you can just navigate to the calendar function and look under January's date. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, first of all, we really encourage you to chat your questions in throughout the presentation. Please don't wait until the end. It's helpful for the presenters to see your questions as they go along. Um, and they've left time to respond to those questions at the end of the webinar today. Um, to the right of your screen, you may see a chat box. If you don't see that chat box, um, if you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see a speech bubble. And if you click on that speech bubble, um, it should open up the chat box. Um, within that chat box, you'll notice there's a, uh, a box and it will let you know who you're chatting your question to. If you um, chat to the host, then our host will collect those questions and share them with the, with the presenters. Um, just as usual, a uh, reminder that all of the information that's presented in today's webinar is current as of today, um, and that while the slide deck is very helpful and we encourage you to refer to it, please um, keep um, in mind that there are official documents governing all of these policies and procedures, and you should refer to those um, as well as keeping an eye on any updates that may be coming out from the state. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, our state partners um, to start the webinar. Hi, thank you. Good morning, this is Kate from Department of Health. Um, thanks everyone for joining. This is, as we said before, part two of the role of CS, the state's designated independent entity for children's HCBS. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover the expanded role of CES, our state designated independent entity. Their role is expanding effective April 1st, 2019. Um, and since CES responsibilities for a child opting out of health home care management were covered in part one, we're gonna to focus today on the expanded role beginning April 1 which is accepting referrals for HCBS eligibility determinations for children who are not enrolled in Medicaid. But that being said, we're gonna give a quick refresher on the existing role of the independent entity, CS. So today, children are transitioning from care coordination provided through a 1915C waiver to health home care management. This transition began on January 1st and will be completed by March 31st. So CS is accepting referrals for all of those transitioning children still. Health home care management is an optional benefit, but HCBS requires a plan of care and service coordination. So to permit a current 1915C waiver child to opt out of health home care management, but still receive aligned children's HCBS, the state designated an independent entity to provide HCBS eligibility determination and develop and manage the HCBS plans of care. So that's a little background on what's happening now and why we have the independent entity CES. So who is the independent entity? Maximus is the state designated independent entity. The program is being branded Children and Youth Evaluation Services, which we're calling CES. Um, and you can find their phone number listed here with their hours of operation, their website, and important to note that CS has staff across all region in New York State who will be deployed to meet with a child or family in their home or regional location of their choice. So still visits can happen from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday and 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturday. So uh, continuing with the refresher, just a general overview of the role of CS. Their responsibilities include delivering the HCBS eligibility determinations for children who are not enrolled in Medicaid and who opt out of health home care management, providing Medicaid application assistance to children who meet level of care using the HCBS eligibility determination who are not enrolled in Medicaid, 
developing HCBS plans of care for children who are referred to ACE to CES without Medicaid and children who opt out of health home care management, updating HCBS plans of care and conducting HCBS eligibility redeterminations for children enrolled in Medicaid who opt out of health home care management, and monitoring plans of care for children in fee-for-service Medicaid. So essentially, we have two tracks here. We have the kids who opt out of health home who will get care coordination from CES, which would include an HCBS eligibility determination or redetermination on an annual basis, development of a plan of care, and monitoring of that plan of care if the child is fee for service Medicaid. The other track is children who are not enrolled in Medicaid at the time that they try and receive um, or pursue HCBS. So for those children, CES will conduct an HCBS eligibility determination, provide Medicaid application assistance, and then develop a plan of care for them. And then at that point, the child has the option to opt into health home care management. So for children receiving HCBS who opt out of health home care management, CS will continue to be responsible for managing HCBS plans of care. This may include meeting with the child or family to acquire signature to the plan of care, adding new HCBS to the plan of care, making referrals to HCBS providers, updating the plan of care and communicating the plan of care to Medicaid managed care plans. But a reminder here, Medicaid managed care plans will monitor access to care for children who are enrolled in their plan. And CS will conduct future HCBS eligibility redetermination. CS will only manage HCBS, so families with other service needs, including CFTSS, may work with their providers or work independently to obtain those services. Just hang tight, my slide deck is freezing. Okay, so now here we are to the meat of this presentation, the expanded role of HC of CS beginning April 1st, 2019. So, Beginning April 1st, 2019, CS will accept referrals for children who are interested in HCBS who are not enrolled in Medicaid. CS will send a nurse assessor to the child's home or other setting of their choice to conduct the HCBS eligibility determination once they've received a complete referral. CS will provide Medicaid application assistance to children who are found to meet level of care using the HCBS eligibility determination and CS will provide education about health home care management. Once the child's Medicaid has been established, the child may opt into health home care management. So a few points here. Um, we know that we've received feedback from providers in the community that sometimes they're in contact with a child who is not enrolled in Medicaid and they would like to maintain those relationships with the child after their Medicaid is established for care management. So at the point that CS educates the child and family on, each, on the uh, benefits of health home care management. They'll also ask them if they've been working with a care manager in the community that they'd like to return to. And if they have and they indicate that, then CS will make a referral back to that provider for care management. So making a referral to CS for a child not enrolled in Medicaid. So anyone can make a child can make a referral to CS to acquire a referral form and consent to share information, call CS or visit their website. A referral form collects information about the child's medical and behavioral health history, which is needed to deliver the HCBS eligibility determination. And just a reminder, before submitting a referral form, please double check that every field is complete and accurate. Collecting information for the HCBS eligibility determination. When CS receives a referral, they will check to ensure that it's complete. If the referral is not complete, CS will reach out to the child or family or referring to obtain the missing information. CS will also talk to practitioners to collect medical and behavioral health information. When all required information for a complete referral is received by CS, CS will, con will contact the child or family to schedule the first appointment. CS will meet with the child and family in their home or other location of preference to collect this information. During the appointment, CS will ask questions about the child's medical and behavioral health history, 
This information will expedite the HCBS eligibility determination. Delivering an HCBS eligibility determination. After CS has conducted the appointment with the child or family to collect information for the HCBS eligibility determination, CS will schedule a meeting with the a meeting to conduct the HCBS eligibility determination. CS will meet with the child or family in their home or other location of preference to conduct the HCBS eligibility determination. Upon completion, the family will be notified of the HCBS eligibility determination and remaining steps to gain access to HCBS will be reviewed. So just a reminder there that, of course, the child can't access HCBS until they have HCBS and Medicaid and a slot a capacity. So what we're talking about here is just making sure that we have all three of those things, HCBS eligibility, Medicaid, and capacity to serve the child. Capacity management. To access aligned children's HCBS, the state must determine that there is capacity to serve the child. When a child is found to meet level of care using the HCBS eligibility determination, CS will submit a request to the capacity management team at New York State Department of Health to examine whether there's capacity to serve the child. The capacity management team will respond to the inquiry within one business day. CS will issue a formal notice of decision to the child or family regarding the HCBS eligibility determination plus information about whether there is immediate capacity to serve the child upon receipt of response from the capacity management team. If the child is not eligible to access HCBS until the state a child is not eligible to access HCBS until the state identifies capacity to serve the child. So they're going to get their HCBS eligibility determination. If they're determined eligible, CS is going to reach out to the capacity management team, which will respond within one business day with whether or not there's immediate capacity to serve the child. And that information, whether there's capacity and the outcome of their HCBS eligibility determination will be communicated to the child or family in one notice of decision letter. Medicaid application assistance. CS will provide Medicaid application assistance to children who have met level of care using the HCBS eligibility determination. CS will meet with the child or family in their respective LDSS office to conduct Medicaid assistance. CS will attach a cover sheet to the completed Medicaid application indicating to the local district that the child has been assessed at level of care using the HCBS eligibility determination and is pursuing Medicaid and HCBS. This cover letter will also indicate to the local district whether the state has determined that there is capacity to serve the child. So they're going to get, so CS will collect all of the information that's needed to complete the Medicaid application, assist the family with completing the application, and will attach a cover sheet that explains that the uh, that explains that the uh, child is eligible for HCBS. All right, Medicaid application processing when capacity is available to serve the child. When the local district receives a Medicaid application for a child who has met level of care using the HCBS eligibility determination, the state has determined that there is capacity to serve the child. So a local district can use special budgeting rules to review the child's eligibility for Medicaid as a family of one, also known as a household of one. In these cases, the child's Medicaid eligibility can be reviewed using only the child's income. The parent's income is not counted in this process. Children who are Medicaid eligible using family of one budgeting rules are fully eligible for Medicaid. So also just a reminder here that not all children who Not all children who uh, have the family of one budgeting methodology applied to their case will be eligible for Medicaid in that way. Um, some examples of children who would not be eligible are children who have high child support payments or high trust funds. 
Medicaid application processing when capacity is not available to serve the child. When the local district receives a Medicaid application for a child who has met level of care using the HCBS eligibility determination, but the state has determined that there is not capacity to serve the child, the local district can open a Medicaid case for the child with a spend down. In these cases, the child is only eligible for Medicaid after the household income minus medical expenses meets the income-based Medicaid eligibility requirements. Children who are Medicaid eligible with a spend down are not fully eligible for Medicaid. When capacity is identified for the child, the local district can update the existing case rather than create a brand new case. Developing an HCBS plan of care. When capacity has been identified to serve the child, CS will meet with the child or family to develop an HCBS plan of care, including HCBS provider selection. HCBS plan of care and plan of care development will happen concurrently with Medicaid application assistance and or Medicaid application processing at the local district. HCBS plans of care are person-centered. CS will meet with the child and family in their home or other location of preference to develop an HCBS plan of care. CS will also discuss the benefits of health home care management with the child or family at this point and will elicit their health home opt-in or opt-out. And making referrals. When Medicaid is established, CS will make a referral to health home for children who have made that selection or make referrals to HCBS providers selected during the plan of care development process. If it's, and again, if the child selected health home and indicated that they were working with a specific CMA, CS will refer them back to that CMA. So I know I've seen quite a few questions come in, so let us just take a minute to start to read those and we'll start answering them. So there was a question about how you recertify a child 
Medicaid eligibility if their family of one came from the OMH waiver. So it doesn't matter which waiver the family of one budget stemmed from. If the child, to get the family of one budget, the child has to be determined level of care for HCBS. And it doesn't matter which waiver that's affiliated with. So when it's time to recertify their Medicaid, as long as they are still current with their HCBS, then they will be able to get that budget. We have a question, if the child is already in Medicaid when they want to start accessing HCBS, do they need to go to CS or would they go another route? Children who are already in Medicaid should go to a health home for their HCBS eligibility determination. Here's a question, does CS also assist members with Medicaid but not interested in health homes? So yes, if a child opts out of health home care management, they can go to CS for the HCBS eligibility determination and plan of care development. There's a question about whether the child or family will be informed if they do not meet the HCBS eligibility requirements. They will be informed. They will get a formal NOD. There's a question, what experience and level of training has been provided to CES on Medicaid application processes, disability determinations, and family of one? Medicaid eligibility determination. So CS is administered by Maximus, who is our enrollment broker in New York State. And they do have staff that are stationed at each of the local districts today that perform Medicaid application assistance. So the state has already been in process of um, leveraging Maximus staff for this role, and they've been doing a great job. As far as disability determinations and family of one goes, Medicaid can only be established, Medicaid eligibility can only be established by the state or the local district. It's not being reviewed or established by Maximus. So Maximus's role is to collect all of the information that's needed to make those determinations and submit it to the appropriate group, so LDSS, to do that. So Maximus is not making disability determinations or determining family of one Medicaid eligibility. So local districts are maintaining responsibility for that. So there's a question, what do we do with waiver use on our wait list that the referral came to us from our local SCOA unit that currently does not have Medicaid? So the way I'm interpreting this is that the child is referred for HCBS eligibility determination and does not have Medicaid. 
a child should be referred to CS for an HCVS eligibility determination. And CS will go through the process of assisting them with Medicaid application if they are determined to HCVS eligible. Here's a question, what does the HCVS eligibility determination visit consist of? So within the CANS, there's a subset of the comprehensive assessment that is the HCVS eligibility determination. And CS will be conducting that um, in person with the family based on the materials that were collected in previous communications with the family or child about their medical or behavioral health history. Here's a question, what happens if the child is not eligible? For example, they still could use some services and do not have Medicaid. So if the child is not eligible for HCBS, then they can't get the family of one budget, but there's a chance that they could still be eligible for Medicaid using community eligibility rules. So if the child um, would like to pursue Medicaid, applying for Medicaid, they certainly can. Um, if they're not eligible, then they would be referred back to the community, um, and that would kind of be the end of the process. Yeah, so there's this question, again, if CS finds that the child will not be eligible for Medicaid, not as a family of one either, will CS refer the child back to the CSPOA in order to serve the child in a non-Medicaid capacity? Yeah, if they are SED. What will happen if a youth meets eligibility but there's no current capacity? So if there's no current capacity to serve the child, then the child essentially not going to be able to receive any services until there's capacity. So um, it puts the child into kind of a, a waiting period, much like what happens today. Um, so CES will continue to monitor their case for their Medicaid eligibility if that's been um, pursued and um, will be on standby for capacity to be available for the child. Do we have Here's a question, do we have to keep a slot open for those children who are in the process of having eligibility determined or can we continue to fill the slots with Medicaid clients? Um, the state is doing the capacity management and my understanding of that process is that they're going to be reserving the slots at the point that the HCBS eligibility is determined. Um, so yes, a slot would be reserved for somebody who's not in Medicaid yet with the assumption that they would get Medicaid. If they don't get Medicaid, the slot would be released. Um, but that prevents the child from kind of being boomeranged back and forth between the system. Um, but just also as a reminder, we are expanding capacity already, so we don't anticipate there being um, a wait list. There's a question about what happens if a medically fragile child is in the hospital waiting for waiver and the waiver is at capacity. There is no wait list for medically fragile children. Here's a question, when will regional representatives contact information be distributed? So I'm not sure. So we are not issuing a list of regional representatives for CS. One of the really great benefits about using CS as the state designated independent entity is that there's one line that you can call to access their services and they will put you in contact with a regional nurse assessor as appropriate. So there's no process in place for referrals to be sent directly to the regional nurse assessor. All communication goes through the 800 number.
There's a question. CX will develop the HCBS plan of care, not the service provider? Question mark. Um, so yes, CS will develop the HCBS plan of care, but as you all know, the service provider will be the one that's making the recommendation for frequency, scope, and duration, which will be updated in the plan of care by CS. So CS will hold it and will be responsible for making that update. But of course, the service provider is the one that's responsible for defining the frequency, scope, and duration of each service. There's a question who will be providing the follow-up to ensure that once CS receives a referral, it will be worked on and processed in a timely fashion. The state does have, um, does receive reports from Maximus and has identified specific criteria such as timeframes that we would like to monitor. So it's us at the state that is going to be doing that oversight. Uh, there's a question that I don't understand, so if the person could maybe rephrase it in a different way, it is, if the child is, e is eligible even with a spend down, is the care manager who provides that information to the local DSS unit on a monthly basis? If you could just rephrase that, I'd be happy to try and answer it. The question, what is the approximate length of time that's anticipated for this process? We've designed this um, with the anticipation that everything would happen within 30 days. We know that there's a lot of um, eyes on how quickly this process can happen. And, you know, just so you know, there are, you know, factors outside of our control, like the LDSS application process. Um, but we've built this in, in a way that we think will be faster than what happens today. Um, and we hope that the local districts will be able to expedite their reviews based on having complete applications and the simple cover sheet. Also, as a reminder, the disability determination that's required for the medically fragile children today is part of the HCBS level of care target population, not their Medicaid eligibility. So um, that should expedite the process as well. There's a question, what will the role of a non-Medicaid care manager be if the youth referred is receiving this service while being assessed for eligibility? Um, if the person who asked this question wants to rephrase it a little bit differently, but um, what I believe you're asking is what if the child is receiving HCBS before they've been determined eligible? And that process is not something that's continuing in the future. It's not something we have authority to do. So. That's why we've spent a lot of time really focusing on the time frames for each um, each step in the process. We think it's going to be very quick. Um, right now, we don't have a way to pay providers for services rendered before the child is Medicaid eligible. So we, we can't carry that process into the future. There's a question, what kind of documentation assessment evals will be required for submission to CS? Um, so that is the referral form, which will be posted on their website. Um, so take a look at that. It's general information relating to their, um, to the child's medical history or behavioral health history that would be needed to complete the HCBS eligibility determination. There's some capacity management questions, which I'm going to skip um, and allow the capacity management team to address on Wednesday's webinar.
Here's the question. CS will actually accompany the family to local DSS to assist with the Medicaid application. Maximus already has staff at the local DSS, so um, they will already be there to assist with the Medicaid application. Here's a question, must quote unquote family of one children always work with CF on Medicaid application slash disability determination process and waiver eligibility after 4-1 or are there any instances wherein a family could opt to work with a health home instead of CS? So CS is the front door for all of the children who don't have Medicaid at the time that they're looking for HCBS. Um, so they're Health home is a Medicaid benefit, so since those children would not have Medicaid, they can't use health home for their HCBS eligibility determination. Those children aren't locked into staying with CS by any means. They can always opt for health home care management once they've been determined to HCBS eligible and Medicaid eligible. But CS is the front door for children who do not have Medicaid who are seeking HCBS. Here's a question, will CS help with recertifications if the youth is still enrolled in HCBS or will that be the role of the health home care manager? So that would depend on whether the child has elected health home care management or has opted out of health home care management and is receiving care coordination from the independent entity CS. So whoever the child is being served by is the one that's responsible for delivering the HCBS eligibility redetermination. There's a question for families that have a trust fund. What is the monthly Medicaid fee paid to CS? Families may choose CS if the Medicaid care management fee is less than health home care management. So um, there must have been a miscommunication because there is no fee paid to CS. Um, so what, what was mentioned related to trust funds is that the child who has a family of one when a child is not Medicaid eligible and they're determined HCBS eligible and they're referred to the local district, the local district can look at just the child's income. If the child themselves has income that puts them over the Medicaid income level, then they're still not going to be eligible. So most children don't have their own income that puts them over the Medicaid eligibility income thresholds, but some children do. So it's just kind of a note, a reminder to folks that the family of one budgeting methodology is not going to catch 100% of children. There's still a chance that a child could have their own income that puts them over. So it's just sort of a reminder to folks. But it's important to understand that there's never a fee that's paid to CS. Um, so that's all. There's a question, will there be an updated referral instruction for any entity? The current referral instructions apply specifically to CMAs. Yes, that will be updated for April 1st when they begin to accept those referrals. And CES assists. CFTSS clients in getting Medicaid? No, CS only is helping the children who are pursuing HCBS eligibility who need Medicaid.
There's a question, how is CES planning on handling the volume of referrals they will be receiving? CES has hired all of their staff already. They have nurse assessors in each region, which have been exhaustively trained on all of the state processes and populations. Um, they also have uh, call center staff who have been exhaustively trained, and um, they are completely prepared for all of the referrals that they're about to get. There's a question about whether the SPOA referral form can be used. No, the CES referral form must be used. There's a question if the child already has Medicaid through SSI and then loses their SSI, would they go to CS to keep their Medicaid active under Family of One? So I'm assuming that this is a child who is HCBS eligible already. And in that case, the local district would already be aware that the child is receiving HCBS. And at the time that they lose their SSI, the local district would already explore all of the other options that are available to keep the child enrolled in Medicaid. There's a question, can we submit supporting documentation such as psychiatric, psychosocial CANs with the referral? Yes, you can. If a There is a question, if a SPOA is completed and family is requesting HCBS, who is responsible for send the application to CES, SPOA, or Health Home Care Management Agency? I am a little confused by the way that it was phrased, so if you want to resubmit phrasing it in a different way, I'd be happy to try and answer. Um, thank you. This question, how should the CSPO go about building relationships with CS if we're unable to communicate with a regional rep? The state is actually going to host a um, meet and greet forum, so look forward to that. The question, at this time, care manager provides documentation to DSS to show that the family is covering the spend down portion, the spend down monthly to keep them eligible. Is it still the role of the care manager to do that on a monthly basis? Yes, we would say that if that's something that you're doing now, you should continue to do that. It sounds like those children are not what we're talking about in this scenario. There's a question, if there is not capacity and the child is on a wait list, will, be, will they be referred to CSPOA to have non-Medicaid services in the interim? Um, yes, they can, CS can provide that referral to CSPOA for children who are SED.
So there's a question here, what will the role of the non-Medicaid care manager, a TCM non-Medicaid care manager be if the use referred is receiving this service while being assessed by CS for waiver eligibility? So providers should not be providing Medicaid services to consumers who don't have Medicaid because they won't be paid. So um, I understand that there may be a process in place with OMH right now, but we don't have authority to continue doing that. So it's really important that you make sure that the child has Medicaid when you start delivering Medicaid services because you won't be paid for any Medicaid services that you provide when the child does not have Medicaid. Here's a question, family of one children need waiver to access Medicaid, so in the absence of Medicaid, how will CS ensure available nurse assessors to meet with new families applying for waiver in absence of insurance coverage? Please confirm the assessments will occur at no charge to the family. The assessments occur at no charge to the family. CS is paid directly by the state, so it's not really a, a fee for service or a plan covered benefit. It's a it's a service that's provided by the state. So there's no need to, to worry about this. There's There's a question, currently disability determination process can be very arduous and take 90 plus days from start to finish. So it would be great to see that time frame shrink to 30 days or less, but how will the state be revising current DD processes to ensure those determinations are received in a more timely fashion moving ahead after 4-1? So um, one thing that's important to note is that the disability determinations for medically fragile children can be, are just part of the target population in the HCDS level of care. So you can complete the OHIP form. A practitioner in the community can complete the OHIP form and they don't need to be reviewed as a formal state or federal disability determination because it's just to meet that target population. But I think the question here is, what about the DD processes and how long they take? So um, a child who is medically fragile in DD could be assessed as just a medically fragile child and potentially get onto the waiver more quickly that way and then complete their DD determination after the fact so that they have access to those DD benefits. Um, but there hasn't been anything part of this project to change any of the DD determination processes. The question, what if a youth has Medicaid and is referred to HCBS through the health home, then loses their Medicaid at a later point? Will the health home provider then refer the youth to CS? Will there be a lapse in services? So I think potentially there are many scenarios where a child could, that could cause a child to lose their Medicaid. Um, In general, the child who has an HDBS eligibility determination that's still current would not need to be reassessed for HDBS eligibility in order to get a Medicaid redetermination. 
So for example, if their HCBS eligibility is from August to August and they lose their Medicaid in September, their HCBS eligibility is still current. If they make it back into the Medicaid office for Medicaid eligibility in October, they could still use their existing HCBS eligibility. Um, so as far as capacity management, um, my understanding is that they are res reserving a slot for a period of time, I believe 90 days. And I'll let them speak to that on their webinar on Wednesday. Just a further point of clarification on that. Um, once the child loses their Medicaid, there's no expectation for the providers to continue providing Medicaid services to the child. So there could be an interruption in their Medicaid eligibility and providers should be monitoring that. There's a question, what is the process to get Medicaid for children seeking CFTSS? So CFTSS is a regular covered Medicaid service or a set of regular, a set of Medicaid services. So just like anyone seeking Medicaid for any other purpose, you would have to go through your local district and be determined eligible or apply on NISO.
There's a question if waiver youth are due for recertification in after April and providers would like to continue services, should this be reviewed now prior to April 1? And the way that I'm interpreting this is if the child's HCBS eligibility is about to expire, should someone be doing a recertification, a redetermination right now? And Yes, normally you would complete their HCBS redetermination a month in advance. So if they're set to expire in April, you should start doing that now. There's a question if the application is incomplete, will CS provide help to obtain clinical documentation? Yes, they will. So there's a question. So a child who is determined eligible for HCBS with family of one Medicaid eligibility is not able to receive care management or CFTSS until there's an HCBS slot available, which is determined by the state. So I think that this might be a little bit out of order, but essentially the children who are not eligible for Medicaid based on their income, who are pers who are so let me phrase that differently. The children who are not eligible for Medicaid any other way, who are waiting for the family of one budget in order to get Medicaid, have to have HCBS capacity as determined by the state and Medicaid in place before they can access any Medicaid benefits, including HCBS care management, or CFTSS. Hope that helps. Here's a question, will there be retroactive reinstatement if a child loses Medicaid eligibility? So that's That's dependent on their Medicaid eligibility as determined by the local district. So CS does not have any role in whether their Medicaid would be reinstated retroactively. There's a question, where can referral and consent forms for CS be found? Those will be posted on their website. Um, their website currently reflects the current process and will be updated with the April 1 process. Um, closer to that date. All right, that's all the questions that I've received. Um, so I don't know if anyone is frantically typing in any more questions at this time, so I'll just give it one more minute. All right. Well, I think that that's I think that that's everything for today. Thanks everyone for joining, and you can always feel free to submit any additional questions to the email on the screen. Um, we'll try and answer those for you. Take care. And uh, just a quick reminder. Thank you, everyone, uh, all the presenters. And um, just a quick reminder that. Um, within about a week or so, um, the slides and the recording of this webinar will be posted. Um, at uh, on the CTAC MCTAC website. Thank you all very much for participating, and uh, we look forward to uh, having you on the next webinar. Thank you.